Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, my name is Alan Vickery. Um, I am at the podium here. I think I saw on the, the, the placard there. Um, uh, I, that hat is, uh, in fact, I, I serve as chairman of the Water Environment Federation's uh, Government Affairs Committee, and I'm here in uh, in that context. I probably also need to advise that uh, uh, my income derives from Stantec Consulting, where I'm a principal in that firm, uh, but I also have a 40-year background in water, principally with the Ohio River Valley Water Sanitation Commission. Most of you know that organization as Orsanco, and I was the uh, chief engineer and executive director of that organization for about 25 years, and a lot of what was done at Orsanco uh, was monitoring, quite frankly in the case of that agency for the Ohio River Valley, the Ohio River Distributary. So I have a long background in water quality monitoring and all of its, its dimensions. Uh, on behalf of the Water and Environment Federation and all of the co-sponsors, including the Northeast Midwest Institute, um, I want to thank you for coming to this uh, congressional briefing uh, this morning. For over a decade, WEF and other co-sponsors have worked with the USGS and the National Water Quality Assessment Program to bring important water quality information to you here on, uh, on Capitol Hill. So today's briefing um, is about monitoring. And so for the next hour, maybe hour and a half, uh, we're going to focus um, on um, monitoring and specifically monitoring analysis, I should note, and specifically monitoring for nutrients and pesticides. Now, uh, editorial from the podium. Um, monitoring assessment, I guess in my view, uh, is the, I call it the fundamental among the fundamentals um, in healthcare, um, health of waters. And actually, our own personal health. Um, I'm sure a few of us have had our blood pressure taken. Uh, I have my blood work done every two or three months. That's monitoring. That is monitoring and assessment. Okay. And so without that personal data, I would not know what my, my own health is. Uh, and compared to previous measurements, what my health was. And where my health is going. And how you can make decisions about managing your health care. It's no different with, with water. The same goes for water. Okay? And the fact that it informs decision making really is, makes it that kind of the fundamental of, of fundamentals. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a tough economy, in a, in a world of changing science and changing technologies, we must be positioned if you will, to make good, smart decisions. Monitoring makes ultimately all that possible. But yet, monitoring programs, at least in my experience, is the one that, uh, it, that requires a lot of energy actually to protect. Uh, because in my, my experience, when the budget gets tight, one of the first places one will look is monitoring programs. It's easy to cut down the number of samples that you, that you take, you know, the laboratory cost and all that. But the price of that, okay, is almost incalculable. You know, you're, again, your ability to make, make good decisions. So you can tell that I am uh, passionate about this issue, and I want to thank um, the USGS and WF for allowing me the, the, the privilege, quite frankly, to serve a moderator today. I'm going to have uh, two great speakers this morning uh, from the United States Geological Survey and, the, uh, and NOAA. Um, that are going to address the topics of, as I mentioned, monitoring uh, the result of the program, their data, uh, in a sense, in a way where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. Uh, this is important stuff, so listen closely. And my best hope is that when you're, when you're back in your offices as you're at this afternoon, you can say, boy, am I glad I went to that, to that briefing. You know, I learned a lot, perhaps, and I have a greater appreciation for, uh, uh, for what ultimately this is, this is all about. Okay. Um, after each presentation, what I will do as moderator is uh, invite uh, what, my, what I will call presentation clarifying questions. Okay. Yeah, if you didn't see something on there that kind of confused you, you want to graph that. Uh, and I want to keep that, you know, 
to a minimum, maybe five minutes or so, and then 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 uh, um, have Suzanne come up. She'll Suzanne will be second, uh, and again have a couple of clarifying questions. And after that, hopefully, we'll begin a conversation. Okay, uh, and I want everybody to have an opportunity to. Uh, to give their views in a sense to ask their questions. Uh, if we run out of time, um, uh, Lori, Suzanne, will you be available after the hearing adjourns to, uh, so you can, yeah, you can color them if you will when we adjourn, but I'm sure some of you have lots of things to do on your, on your schedules. So that's where we are. And um, we have a lot of ground to cover. Um, uh, I would mention also that uh, I, I look at this briefing as a bit the last jewel on a crown this week. The crown this week was Water Week here in Washington, D.C. The first time I think that Water Week has been staged in Washington, where a number of non-governmental organizations and professional organizations representing utilities and the broad spectrum, uh, many of us met as organizations in, in, in Washington, D.C. There have been, you know, there have been uh, forums and um, uh, expositions and things like that. And I look at this briefing as being that last jewel if you will, in the crown of activities this week in Water Week. And, and um, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll do another one next year and make it even better and more effective for you. Um, I think all of us that have been involved in Water Week are interested in any suggestions you might have for how Water Week in the future can work for you better. So feel free to give me your, your ideas as you, as you might have them. So um, uh, what we're going to do is uh, for now call on Lori Sprague uh, um, uh, to uh, give us a, a kind of a, 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 a presentation on NACWA's National Water Quality Assessment Program, their program, um, and, and how it is illuminating trends in nutrients and, and, and pesticides. Um, Lori has been a hydrologist with the USGS for 15 years. She currently is, is the uh, Surface Water Trends Coordinator, Coordinator for the National Water Quality Assessment Program, NACWA, which collects information on water chemistry and aquatic life to provide science-based insights on surface and groundwater issues throughout the United States. Prior to her work with the NACWA program, she researched nutrient trends in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, uh, the effects of drought and urbanization on stream quality in Colorado, and watershed modeling in the Missouri River Basin. Uh, I've seen her presentation, uh, both of their presentation, and it's at a technical level that even I can understand. I'm an engineer, so I think you will find it fascinating. And uh, um, uh, Lori, let me give the podium to you for your presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. I think everyone in this room appreciates the valuable resource that our rivers and streams are. They provide drinking water, they provide irrigation for crops, they provide habitat for aquatic life and plenty of recreational opportunities. But they're also under continual pressure from urban and agricultural pollution. Since passage of the Clean Water Act in 1972, the federal government has spent billions of dollars on urban and industrial waste treatment and on conservation practices that are designed to reduce the amount of agricultural, agricultural pollution and runoff. State and local governments spend billions more each year. Um, recently, though, the EPA has reported that over half of the nation's stream miles have ecosystems that are in impaired condition. So in order to understand the return on our investment and to more effectively manage our water resources in the future, we want to understand how and why water quality has been changing over time. In 1991, the USGS began monitoring the nation's water quality through its National Water Quality Assessment Program. And one of our major goals has been to assess trends in water quality. We focused our initial analyses on two important groups of contaminants, nutrients, and pesticides. Um, now we're in the process of expanding our analyses to sediment, carbon, salinity, and aquatic life. But today I'm going to focus on our results from nutrients and pesticides to tell you what we've learned about how they've been changing and what we know and what we don't know about why they've been changing. 
I'm also going to focus on the Mississippi River Basin, which covers about 40% of the country. Um, it covers a wide range of climatic influences, urban and agricultural influences, so in that way it's representative of the entire country. And many of the lessons that we've learned there can be applied throughout the United States. I'm going to start with nutrients, and as their name suggests, they are essential for healthy plant and animal populations, but at high levels they can degrade water quality. Um, recent reporting by the state's EPA indicates that over 7,000 stream reaches in the United States have, uh, are not meeting water quality goals because they're too contaminated for basic uses like fishing and swimming. Here are a couple of examples of problems with elevated nutrients. High nutrients can cause excessive growth of algae, and when those algae die, it causes low dissolved oxygen in water, which is also known as hypoxia. And we have hypoxic conditions in many of the nation's estuaries, including Puget Sound, Chesapeake Bay, and the Gulf of Mexico. The largest hypoxic zone in the country and the second largest in the world is in the northern Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Louisiana and Texas. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that shortly. High nutrients also cause problems in drinking water supplies. Uh, for example, this past summer, we saw record nitrate concentrations in the Des Moines River and the Raccoon River in Iowa. And those are the two main water sources for the Des Moines Waterworks. The concentrations of nitrate were about 20 milligrams per liter in those rivers, which is twice the EPA maximum contaminant level for nitrate in drinking water. To treat the water to come into compliance with that standard cost rate payers an extra $900,000. <laughs> Nationally, the largest source of nutrients is fertilizer use in agricultural and urban areas, followed by animal manure and the atmosphere. Since 1945, the use of commercial fertilizers has increased by tenfold, and that's in response to an increase in the application rate and in crop acreage. Animal manures remain relatively stable. Um, inputs from the atmosphere have nearly doubled. On average, about 16% of the nitrogen that hits the land surface from these sources is not taken up by crops and ultimately reaches rivers and streams. We know that there are other important sources of nutrients that are not as well tracked over time, and this includes discharges from wastewater treatment facilities and septic systems. Uh, we do know that those sources have generally increased over time during this period as the population of the United States increased by about 150 million people. A detailed understanding of how each of these sources has changed over time is really critical to be able to explain the causes of nutrient trends that we're seeing in streams and rivers. To help us understand the effect of those changing nutrient inputs over the last century, <clears throat> we analyzed nutrient data that had been collected from streams in the United States um, early in the 20th century. Those data only exist for a small number of streams, fewer than 20, but they tell us, as you might expect, that conditions today are very different than they were a century ago. In the streams that we looked at, concentrations are now much higher. As an example, um, you can see here that Nitrate concentrations in the Illinois River increased steadily since 1920, corresponding to an increase in population and fertilizer application in urban and agricultural areas. While the Clean Water Act in 1972 mandated limits on discharges from point sources like wastewater treatment plants, it did not address diffuse non-point sources like runoff from urban and agricultural areas. The watershed of the Illinois River has both. It has numerous large cities as well as intensive agriculture. And now non-point sources are the largest source of nitrogen to the river. Because we didn't regularly monitor streams throughout the 20th century, um, and because we didn't monitor every stream, we don't have detailed knowledge of how things have changed over time. But the National Water Quality assessment program, along with monitoring by EPA and others, now provides more consistent and widespread monitoring of the nation's streams. So we should have a better understanding of how conditions are changing nationally and should be getting a better understanding of what's been causing those changes. In 
our first national assessment of nutrient trends using recent monitoring data, go ahead and animate this, uh, we found that total nitrogen concentrations in U.S. streams remained stable or increased in 84% of the streams that we looked at. Um, there were decreases in only 16% of the streams, and the same was true for phosphorus. Those stable and upper trends are an indication that efforts to limit nutrients hadn't had a widespread effect by 2003. We have more recent data for the Mississippi River Basin. Um, so our more recent analyses provide an updated look at nitrogen trends and a more detailed understanding of what's been causing those trends. In 2010, the hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico was about 7,700 square miles, which is about the size of New Jersey. That hypoxic zone threatens the commercial and recreational fisheries in the Gulf that bring about a billion dollars every year into the Gulf economy. And it's largely, well, primarily caused by um, nutrients that are entering the Gulf of Mexico from the Mississippi River watershed. An EPA Science Advisory Committee has recommended that a 45% reduction in the nitrogen and phosphorus loading to the Gulf of Mexico, that's a reduction of almost half is gonna be needed to reduce the size of the hypoxic zone to the goal that's been set by the Mississippi River Gulf of uh, Mexico Watershed Task Force. So to help achieve that reduction, we spend billions of dollars every year on urban stormwater controls, agricultural conservation practices, and upgraded wastewater treatment technology. Even with those efforts, we saw mixed results in the basin. Um, at over half the sites, nitrate loads were increasing between 1980 and 2010. In particular, the loads in the Missouri River and the upper Mississippi River increased by about 50% during those 30 years. And that was more than three times the increase we saw at any other site. We have seen some recent signs of progress, however, um, nitrate loads in the Illinois and Iowa rivers, and this is in the heart of the Corn Belt, decreased by about 15% during this period, with much of that decreasing occurring in the recent decade after years of stable or unchanging conditions. But even with those decreases, overall in the basin, the nitrate loading into the Gulf of Mexico from the Mississippi River increased by 14% between 1980 and 2010. And as a result of that continued increase, federal, state, and local governments are intensifying their efforts to um, implement conservation practices and upgrade wastewater treatment facilities. Each of the states in the basin are developing a nutrient reduction plan, and USDA is working with producers to voluntarily implement conservation practices in areas where we expect there to be the greatest loading entering new, uh, local waters or ultimately the Gulf of Mexico. Determining the effects of any past or future conservation efforts, in addition to any kind of source changes that are happening in the Mississippi watershed, is challenging because of the number of nutrient sources and um, how much they are changing over time, and also because of the fact that we don't have detailed information on how each of them has been changing over time. Um, in 2002, we estimated that the largest sources of nitrogen to the Gulf of Mexico were agricultural, fertilizer, manure, and legume crops. And and in particular, farm fertilizer was about 40% of the total. That compares to 14% for urban sources like wastewater treatment facilities and um, runoff from roads and lawns. All of these sources are simultaneously changing over time. Some of them are changing more than others, and they may be changing in different directions. They all combine together to determine the trends in water quality that we see in the streams and rivers. And it's not just the sources that are driving trends one way or another. Changing climate and changing management practices can also have an effect. So for example, we may have a sustained shift in crops from soybeans to corn, which can increase fertilizer application, yet at the same time be implementing agricultural conservation practices like buffer strips that are designed to trap and reduce the amount of nutrients that are reaching streams. Um, we may have improved irrigation technologies that are reducing the amount of nutrients in runoff 
but also be increasing tidal drainage, which can accelerate the movement of nutrients to streams. In urban areas, we may be implementing stormwater controls that help reduce the amount of nutrients reaching streams, but also be increasing impervious areas like parking lots and roads, which move water and nutrients more quickly to the stream. So just like with the sources, determining the individual influence of those factors on water quality requires a detailed knowledge of how they're changing over time. A source that's often overlooked when evaluating the causes of trends in nutrients is the transport of nitrogen through groundwater to streams, which occurs on a very different time scale than surface runoff. When nitrogen is on the land surface, it can reach streams pretty quickly through surface runoff, or it can be transported to the stream through groundwater. Um, depending on the path that groundwater takes, it can take anywhere from days to decades or even centuries for the nitrate to reach the river. That can cause a delay between changes on the land surface and the response of water quality in the streams. And that can contribute to a uh, misallocation of pollution sources in TMDLs or a misunderstanding about the effectiveness of management practices. In the Mississippi River, we've looked at how nitrate concentrations have changed under different stream flow conditions to help us understand runoff versus groundwater. Um, this figure is showing nitrate concentrations at high stream flows in the Mississippi River near where it enters the Gulf of Mexico in May, which is one of the main fertilizer application periods in the watershed. And during high stream flow, that's when a lot of the water in the river is coming from surface runoff. That concentration decline that you see there is an indication that we may be making progress in controlling nutrients in surface runoff. But in contrast to that, there's been an increase in nitrate concentrations at low stream flows when much more of the water in the stream is coming from groundwater inflows. So that's a sign that nitrate concentrations in groundwater are increasing and contributing to increasing nitrate in the river. Because of the slow movement of nitrogen through groundwater, the change at low flow may actually be a reflection of fertilizer application and land management practices from many years ago. Similarly, we may not see the effects or the full effects of today's management practices until many years in the future. Okay, now I'm going to show you what we found for trends in pesticides. Uh, pesticides, of course, provide a range of benefits, including increased food production and a reduction in insect-borne disease. But their use in the environment also raises concerns about possible adverse impacts. Um, they are used in the environment primarily in agricultural areas on crops and orchards, and also in urban areas on lawns and gardens and roadways. Once they're in the environment, they can affect humans, aquatic life, or wildlife if they reach toxic levels. A USGS assessment of pesticide concentrations in streams found that 57% of agricultural streams and 83% of urban streams had one or more pesticides that exceeded benchmarks that have been established by EPA for the protection of aquatic life. Far fewer streams exceeded the human health benchmarks. It was about 10% for agricultural streams and 7% for urban streams. Just like with fertilizer, total pesticide use for agriculture has dramatically increased over the 20th century. Um, between 1930 and about 1980, there is uh, nearly a tripling of total pesticide use. Um, and it's dropped a little bit after 1980 in response to stabilizing herbicide use and a decrease by about half in insecticide use. And that's largely in response to the introduction of new pesticides that were more potent and required smaller application amounts. Trends in the use of individual pesticides can vary pretty widely from these national patterns. Um, and there are also Pesticides that are used in small quantities nationally, but they're very important locally depending on the kind of crops or uh, pests that are present. For example, on these maps are showing the use of the herbicides atrazine and DCPA in 1992. Atrazine is one of the mo most widely used herbicides in the country and it's used primarily on corn in the Midwest. Um, DCPA is an herbicide that's used primarily on vegetables and other specialty crops and it's used in smaller amounts over a smaller area. 
the change in these two herbicides also differed over time. Um, atrazine use has remained fairly stable between 1992 and 2011. But the use of DCPA decreased in the southeast and the Midwest and increased a little bit in the northwest. Understanding these kinds of changes is critical to being able to explain how they're affecting trends in pesticides. <clears throat> Unlike nutrients, pesticides only have one major source in the environment, and that's their use in urban or agricultural areas. Um, their application rates are highly regulated, so we're able to make a more clear-cut connection between changes in pesticide use and changes in pesticide concentrations in streams. But pesticides can also be affected by many of the same management factors that I mentioned earlier for nutrients. Pesticide trends are also affected by each pesticide's unique chemical properties, which can affect its persistence and mobility in the environment. And as an example of that, um, the insecticide DDT, which is very persistent in the environment, is still being detected in stream sediment and fish tissue decades after it was discontinued in the 1970s. Concentrations of more recent, relatively short-lived pesticides, though, tend to respond more quickly to changes in use. For example, concentrations of the herbicide metolachlor either decreased or stayed the same in most of the major rivers that we looked at between 1997 and 2006. And the same pattern was true for a number of other major pesticides that we looked at. The declines closely correspond to declines in their annual use, confirming that changing use is an effective strategy for controlling pesticide contamination in streams. This was particularly true for, for metolachlor due to the introduction of a more potent reformulation of metolachlor in 1997 that required lower application rates. And I'm going to show you one site in a bit more detail. This is the Wabash River in Indiana, which is a typical agricultural stream in the Corn Belt. And you can see the correspondence between the decrease in metolachlor use in red and the decrease in metolachlor concentration in black. As in many other streams, we saw decreases in both use and concentration during this period. There are other potential contributors to that decline in concentration, including agricultural conservation practices. But we can't definitively establish the effect of these conservation practices because we don't have data on how they've changed over time. While we can pretty reasonably estimate agricultural use of pesticides from available survey data, pesticide use in urban areas is not routinely tracked. So we have to use change, uh, information on changes in regulation and the introduction or discontinuation of pesticides to help us understand what's causing changes in urban streams. For example, in 2000, the EPA and insecticide manufacturers reached an agreement to phase out the residential uses of the insecticide diazinon. And that resulted in decreasing sales of diazinon for home and garden use and a corresponding increase in replacement pesticides. As a result of that, also there were widespread declines in diazinon concentrations in streams, uh, which you can see in the map here. And I want to show you Again, a more detailed look at a site in the Corn Belt. And this is an urban stream, Salt Creek in Illinois. There was a pretty clear downturn in diazinon in Salt Creek uh, between about 2003 and 2006, which began just out after the phase out of indoor residential uses of diazinon and continued during the phase out of outdoor residential uses. And this was about a 90% concentration dec decline in this stream. As I mentioned, paired with that declining sale, uh, sales of diazinon, we saw increasing sales of replacement pesticides like fipronil. And we also saw widespread increases in fipronil concentrations in streams. And this is a pattern that we've seen repeatedly where we have a, a decline in concentrations of one pesticide corresponding to increases in concentrations of its replacement. Regular monitoring is going to be required to know if those replacement pesticides are reaching streams in less toxic amounts. We also regularly reevaluate the pesticides that we're targeting for monitoring because use changes so quickly and there are um, a continual introduction of new pesticides to the market. Based on these results, we've reached some important conclusions about nutrient and pesticide trends. Um, and 
some, we've learned some lessons about what they tell us for managing water quality in the United States. First, nitrate loading to the Gulf of Mexico from the Mississippi River increased 14% between 1980 and 2012, and this is increasing problems with the hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico. The causes of that are difficult to determine. We know that there have been decreases in some parts of the basin and increases in other parts. There is evidence that one contributor to the increase is increasing concentrations in groundwater that are, that's flowing into the Mississippi River and its tributaries. And that can be causing delays between management practices being implemented in the watershed and the response of the water quality in the rivers. In contrast to that, concentrations of many of the pesticides that we monitored have declined or stayed relatively stable between the late 1990s and 2008. Pesticide concentrations are strongly controlled by use. So if use goes up, concentration goes up, and vice versa. If use goes down, concentrations go down. Because pesticides only have that one major source in the environment, we've been able to make more clear-cut progress in managing pesticides in streams. So what are the lessons that we've learned for managing water quality? First, when it comes to managing sources, reducing pesticide use reduces concentrations. Although some pesticides may respond more slowly than others if they're more persistent, controlling use is a proven strategy. It gets more complicated for nutrients like nitrate because there are so many factors and so many sources affecting nutrients. We may see a decrease in one source that gets masked by an increase or one or more other sources. Also, the slow movement of nutrients through groundwater can delay a stream's response to cleanup efforts for many years. Second, aside from the direct influence of pesticide use changes, we have not seen widespread and consistent improvements in either nutrients or pesticides in response to the investments that we've made over the years in stormwater controls, agricultural conservation practices, or wastewater treatment upgrades. Those practices may have had a positive effect. We might have seen larger increases if they hadn't been present. But the lack of widespread declines suggests that reductions from those management efforts are either being offset by other things or we're not doing enough. Without improved data on where and when specific strategies or source changes are, are occurring, we can't reliably determine their effect on trends in water quality. And that is the greatest barrier that we have right now to fully explaining the causes of the water quality trends that we're seeing. USGS is working with other agencies to develop those data where they're available. Uh, we work with state regulatory agencies who compile fertilizer sales data annually to get that information. Um, and we work with USDA, for example, to get um, livestock manure and crop acreage information from the Census of Agriculture. But there are other data sources that we need information on that are either unavailable or they've been collected so inconsistently over time that we can't use them in our assessments. To, to, to determine the most cost-effective and, ef and efficient approaches to managing water quality in the future, we need to improve the national tracking of all major sources, management factors, and other influences on water quality, and pair that with continued and enhanced long-term monitoring of rivers and streams. Thank you for your attention. Um, so all this water we have flows to the estuaries, and um, um, so appropriately, um, we're going to bring to the podium now uh, Suzanne Bricker uh, of NOAA's National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science. Um, she's head of the National Estuarine Eutrophication Assessment. Why don't we get that right? Um, now this assessment has produced a national picture of eutrophication impacts, causes, and forecasts of future changes in 1999 and again in 2007. Her work has a strong focus on the development of tools for the use in guiding successful management of coastal, coastal eutrophication. Um, so we're going to kind of close this loop, if you will, of underwater the coast and with an understanding of um, some PowerPoints that uh, Suzanne's going to show us. Suzanne, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. And I especially want to thank the USGS for inviting me because, for one thing, it does close the loop. Um, what I will be talking about today is the endpoint of what Laurie was talking about, the nutrients. And I will be talking only about nutrients also. But they are coming down from the watershed. And where I start my research is where her research ends. So I'd like to tell you about our National Estuarine Eutrophication Assessment. And most importantly, I would like to highlight the collaboration that we've had with USGS. Without their work that you've just seen highlighted, um, we wouldn't be able to put the story together, which I'm just about to tell you. So our study of nutrient pollution, also called eutrophication, looked at nutrient-related water quality conditions and also the loads or the reasons for those conditions that the USGS data that, that they generously shared with us was how we looked at the loads. And then we also tried to look at and forecast, knowing what we know, what might happen in the future in 20 years. Um. OK, there we go. So although my focus is, is the US, um, I wanted to share this slide because the, the legislation that we have here, the, for instance, the Clean Water Act, which mandates monitoring, assessment, management, um, because uh, nutrients are so, such a concern here, that is shared by legislation and paralleled by legislation everywhere. And here we have some listed on this slide from Europe because it's a concern everywhere. It's a global problem. Um, and, and as an example, if you look at this, um, do we have a, is this a pointer? Oh, the, so this is a map of Europe. And, and the important thing to see here is that the red dots are confirmed impaired waters from nutrients, and the yellow dots are concern, areas of concern. So this is recognized as an international problem right now. And actually, we have done some work so that we can share information about how to assess and also how to manage um, internationally. OK, so what does it look like? Well, here's some pictures. And uh, these are pictures that you actually have probably seen in your travels. And what this shows actually is algal blooms, which are the first step of nutrient-related problems. And algal blooms then can lead to low dissolved oxygen. Low dissolved oxygen can lead to problems with fish kills and other kind of uh, uh, what they call stinky beach in some places. Um, in addition, excessive algal blooms can, as you see here in the bottom in Florida, a picture on the left corner, can sh shade out and kill seagrasses, which are habitat for fish. And so that causes a problem with fish diversity and abundance. And there are also a problem with toxic blooms. So these are all problems that occur all over the US coastline. And this is recognized as a national problem in addition to being international. Um, so in our eutrophication assessment, we um, developed an index to look at conditions using the indicators that I just talked about the algal blooms, low dissolved oxygen, losses of seagrasses, and harmful algal blooms and toxic blooms. And we evaluated 141 US estuaries. And we evaluated the early 1990s, and then again in the early 2000s. So the trends that Lori showed actually correspond very nicely with the decade of change that we see in the, between the two studies. So this map shows conditions actually in the early 2000s, all around the US coastline. Red and orange are uh, highest level or worst case impacts based on those indicator, a combination of those indicators. White dots or squares indicate that where we do ha not have data. And so I would like for you to keep that in your mind, that there are some places we cannot evaluate. Um, See what else? Uh, upward arrow means that it improved from uh, 19, early 90s to early 2000s. And downward arrow means that they, the conditions worsened. So two things to note um, is, that, is that if you look at the Middle Atlantic region, you'll see a lot of red. Um, typically, where you see the worst problems are in places where 
population or animals are focused. And so, as an example, the Middle Atlantic region, if you look down in the, at the Gulf of Mexico, you see that red dot? That's exactly the outflow from the Mississippi River, where also called the dead zone by by some people. Um, and as Laurie had said, the Mississippi River drains something like 50% of the US. So um, the majority of estuaries evaluated that you see have a moderate to high level of nutrient-related problems or, or degradation in their water bodies. Overall, conditions have remained the same if you look in the table in the bottom between the early 1990s and the early 2000s. Somewhere between 65 to 70 percent of estuaries have moderate to high level impacts in both time frames despite the efforts to reduce flows. And we saw that also um, that, that there have actually been increasing nutrient loads according to Lori's research in that same time frame. So that, that's actually very concerning. The largest sources that relate to areas of impact, where we see impact, are from non-point sources, and specifically from agricultural runoff. That's the largest source of nutrient-related impacts. How do we know this? We know this because the USGS generously shared their data and analyses with us, and that we can then overlay that with where we see water quality problems. <coughs> this next slide is the other part of, of what we look at, which is trying to, to see what may happen in the future, say 20 to 30 years down the road. Given what we know about present conditions, what we know about existing and planned management measures, and also expected changes in population and land use. You can see, again, in the white squares are places we don't have enough data to make the evaluation. Uh, the red and orange are places where we expect conditions to worsen in the future. Uh, green and blue, we expect places to improve in the future. And in yellow, they remain the same. So from those systems we've been able to evaluate, we see that most are expected to worsen. The number expected to improve, if you look at the tables on the bottom, has actually increased from the 1990s study to the 2000s study. And I like to think that that is indicative of the attention that we are now paying to management of nutrients and that we're feeling more hopeful and actually seeing some results that loads will decrease and that we will see improvements in water quality. Okay. So this slide shows in a different way the changes from the early 1990s to the early 2000s. Again, we have a large number on the right-hand side, the blue bar, that we cannot make an evaluation with. But the green bar shows the number of estuaries that have improved, the red bar, estuaries that have worsened. It's interesting, but they are, if you can see, exactly the same amount, worsened and improved. Um, for the most part, Conditions have remained the same in most estuaries. And I like to think that this is a f because we're of our management that we're able to hold the line against really terrible degradation. Um, and we know that the improvements are from uh, ma uh, nutrient management, mostly from point sources, because they're more cost effective and also more easily implemented than non-point sources, which are the biggest concern right now. The worsening conditions were attributed to continued population increase and associated human level activities in coastal watersheds. The fact that conditions in most estuaries have remained the same despite our management efforts, even though they would probably be a lot worse if we didn't implement management, it is still cause for concern. I have to say here again that the USGS nutrient monitoring, modeling, and, and analyses were critical and key to putting together our story here so that I could share with that with you today. So I borrowed a slide from the USGS so that I can highlight about the need for the kind of work that they're doing. 
Um, this shows the top 20 Mississippi River Basin watersheds contributing the largest amounts of nitrogen to the Gulf of Mexico. Oh, and I didn't say earlier, but we're sticking only with nitrogen to, to for, for um, time, and also because that's the nutrient that is usually the most troublesome in um, marine and brackish waters. So, in order to make progress on improving our estuarine water quality, and as we've seen, we need, we, we are, we need to do that, um, what we need to understand is what nutrient sources are and what areas are contributing contributing the largest amounts of nutrients, and that information will help us to target our management. That is exactly the information that the USGS provides us. And so you can see here in the colors that the models can be used to identify what nutrient sources and areas contribute the most, in this case, to the Gulf of Mexico, to that red dot which we call the dead zone. The dark areas, or the darker areas, are the areas where there's higher contribution of nutrients. The top 20 basins, top 20 contributors, are those that are highlighted in yellow. Okay, so this I also borrowed from the USGS. And what this shows is a focus on the 20 watersheds that were outlined in yellow, the highest contributors. And what I'd like to say about this is that the USGS models can provide insights about what sources are contributing the largest amounts, not just how much and where, but what the actual sources are. We see that non-point sources, and in particular farm fertilizer, is generally the largest source of nutrients that are being transported from the Mississippi River Basin down to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, we do see three or four um, sites where sewage is still a uh, major source in the, in the watershed, but for the most part, the um, improvements to wastewater treatment have actually done a pretty good job at reducing nutrient sources from point sources. These USGS findings are reflective of what our NOAA assessment found on a national basis that the biggest concern for management right now is non-point sources and specifically agricultural sources. So knowledge of the location and the magnitude and the actual source helps us to target nutrient management actions where they'll have the greatest benefit in protecting downstream waters, Gulf of Mexico and our other estuarine resources around the US. Additionally, um, it helps resource managers to target very limited resources to the places that we can make the, the biggest benefit to, to water quality. And this is, again, I have to plug the USGS, this is the, the, the way that they're helping us is to do that targeting by the research that they've done. So I want to leave you with a, a hopeful note. Um, and that is, I want to tell you the story about Tampa Bay, and I will also say that this is simplified, and so there are other confounding factors, but the overall story is this. From the 1950s to the early 1990s, Tampa Bay lost about half their, half their seagrasses on account of nutrient-related um, problems. The goal from the 1980s was to bring back seagrasses so that the fish would come back, and wading birds and so forth, back to levels that they saw in the 1950s. And so what they did was they put three actions, main, main actions, into place. Improvements to wastewater treatment plants, stormwater regulations were implemented, and the phosphate industry developed and also improved some of the ones they were using, their practices of, for instance, loading and unloading uh, fertilizer from the dock to the boat. This has cost about $30 million a year. Um, and on a, on a side note, if you were looking at trends, there was a lag in the time that, that nutrients were reduced and they got, began to see the regrowth of the seagrasses. So that's a little disconcerting. And as, but as Laurie showed, it happened to, in one of her slides about uh, groundwater. They did an investigation, and, and again, this is a simplification, but part of the reason for that delay was that they had a fairly large groundwater source of nutrients to Tampa Bay. So the good news that I'd like to leave you with is that 
Since the 1980s, because of these management um, measures, actions, loads have been reduced by 60%, and there has been a significant and continuing increase of seagrass acreage. They're not yet to the 1950s levels, but they have made a lot of progress, and there has been a lot of regrowth. So in summary, what I'd like to leave you with is this, that about 65% of U.S. estuaries that we've been able to evaluate have moderate to high level nutrient related or eutrophication problems in their water quality. Improvements are possible, we've seen that, but the same number of improve, improved systems, they are counterbalanced by systems that are worsening. For the most part, these problems are caused by non-point sources, and agriculture is probably the number one of non-point sources that we have concerns about. Thus, we believe that management needs to continue. Um, one of the more innovative management measures that are being investigated right now are looking at in-the-water measures, and one of those is the use of shellfish aquaculture, because they filter the water and clean it, as a complement to traditional land-based nutrient management measures. Um, they're doing research now in several parts of the country about that. But the biggest thing I want to leave you with is that the USGS nutrient monitoring and modeling has been really critical for us at NOAA to put this story together and to be able to say what we can say about what things look like around the U.S. coastline in terms of water quality and what it might look like and more importantly, what should be done about it. Um, we've had a very, very productive collaboration and I hope that will continue. And I, the, the USGS is doing some really fine work that helps us out a lot. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I mentioned our uh, presenters, uh, Laura and Suzanne again, thank you. Awesome. Um, are going to hang around here. So if you're one that has something that needs to follow up, they'll be here for a while. Uh, I want to thank, um, again, the Northeast Midwest Institute, uh, Water Environment Federation, obviously USGS and NOAA, uh, for making this happen. And for, for all of you who are very busy that took time out of your day to come hand, down here and learn about this stuff. And I'm going to say again, I hope that you will look back this afternoon and say, I'm glad I went to that briefing. I learned a lot. And if I need to know more, I know who to talk to. So so with all of that, again, we'll, we'll uh, now declare this briefing concluded.